A report from Group 17 by Robert C. O'Brien, Chapter 16. Dr. Schutz felt like a card player who had been dealt a perfect hand. That is, he felt elated and lucky, and he knew the importance of showing no trace of this elation in his face or behavior. He also knew that his luck was the result of patience as much as chance. If one played long enough, it was inevitable that one would get the right cards eventually, just as, it, just as if one tossed a coin long enough, it would land heads 50 or even 100 times in a row. A German mathematics professor he had known in the old days once calculated how many tosses it would require for this to happen dependably on the average, an astronomical figure, but finite. Dr. Schutz had been playing the game for a long time, since January 14, 1945 to be precise, when his laboratory in Silesia had been surrounded by heavy-booted Russian soldiers in long brown overcoats, who burst upon his locked door while he was deep in his greatest piece of biological research. They had liberated all five of his current of experimental subjects, three men, two women, thereby ensuring all of their deaths within a few days. But the Russian commanding officer, a loud-voiced party member with a crude knowledge of German, had had a dossier and instructions on him, Helmuth Schultz, and had interrogated him and shipped him east to Moscow with a boxcar load of other elite political prisoners. In the years since that time, he had kept the experiment going, refining the techniques, working the fine specific gravity ratios to precise perfection, regulating the graduations of their effect from null to mild to intense to acute, with finite variations in between, with infinite variations in between. All of this he had done under the noses of his Russian masters. All of it he had carefully recorded in his own military research reports, its true meaning unsuspected and incomprehensible to them. No doubt they regarded him as slightly mad, no matter their own military research. He had finished, always on schedule, and it was clearly reported. They were satisfied, and his private research was not for the benefit of the Russians. It was, rather, to benefit a German scientist named Hans von Brunker, von Brunkner, a biologist who lived in Eidelberg, a town in the Leuenberger Haig, not far from Hamburg, and also not far but far enough from where Dr. Schutz had spent his boyhood, the only contented period of his life. Sitting tonight in his chair in his room in Villa Petrograd, Dr. Schutz dreamed about Dr. von Bruckner, not for the first time, nor even the hundredth. He lived in a comfortable house, large but not ostentatious, with a touch of Gothic in its architecture. His own well-equipped laboratory stood a suitable distance away from a separate building on the same spacious grounds. He lectured once a week to a respectable group of graduate students at the University of Hamburg. And after the lecture, in an hour of relaxation, he shared a glass of wine in the stube with two or three of his students who asked interesting questions about genetics. Once a month, Dr. Van Bruckner paid a visit to his old and close friend, Friedrich Kassel, now Minister of Defense of the German Republic, whom he had known so well in the old days, the days before the Third Reich was crushed. There, in the minister's own living room, they talked about the state of science in Germany, and particularly about progress in some biological work related to the defense of the fatherland. It was, of course, progressing well. Dr. von Bruckner, in summary, led a quiet, useful, prestigious, and prosperous life in an even more prosperous Germany, which owed its prosperity as well as its unquestioned leadership among nations of the world to him. Dr. Schutz was particularly pleased with the name Hans von Bruckner, one of his better inventions, because it had a pure Germanic sound, as did the music of the composer to whom, from whom he had adapted it. The dream was the end product of his plan. Like the rest of the plan, it was flexible, amiable to change, as all good plans must be. At present, for example, he was still deciding what to do with the girl. His original idea had been to complete the experiment make the last refinements, go through the delicate process of administering the Steinkopf syndrome for the first time in an open flow water treatment system, record the results, and then dispose of her by means of the same cremating equipment they used for the apes. Now instead, he was considering taking her with him. It was not essential yet. The idea had an elegance, a flair, like a flourish at the end of a signature. After the explanations of theory, 
the supporting statistics, the drawings and equations he would mark on the blackboards, they would be convinced, at least enough to let him prove what they claimed, but how much more effective to bring the proof forward then and there, the girl herself, the first walking victim of the infallible weapon he had developed. He thought there would be no dip difficulty in taking her with him, or if there was, it would occur at the very beginning of the trip, perhaps an added problem in arranging a passport. But the man who was going to get the passport, the man who headed the organization that would also provide him with air tickets and money, that man would know, and if it was impossible to take the girl, Dr. Schutz would simply abandon her in Washington. She would not tell anyone where she, would, where she had been. She would betray no secrets. He had the name and the street address of the man firmly fixed in his memory, but not committed to paper. It had been given to him along with other essential information in Nova Kunetsk by laboratory subject TM9 and returned for a few more days of life. It was subject TM9 who had also first told him of the existence and location of the Villa Petrograd. TM9 had in fact worked at the Soviet Washington Embassy and stayed at the villa quite frequently. That was before he had fallen on evil times and corrupt imperialist companionship, before he had been tried, convicted of conspiracy against the state, and sent to Siberia. It was he who gave Dr. Schutz the specific information he had needed to complete the plan he had nurtured for so long. In return, Dr. Schutz, after postponing his death as long as he safely could, allowed him to die by accidentally narcotization rather than by Clostridium Baltunium, the bacillus under study at the time. The subsequent, in subsequent reports, Dr. Schutz had been subtly to stress, had begun subtly to stress the advisability, slowly, slowly, making it sound like a necessity, of trying out his mutant waterborne bacteria on an actual open flow water purification system. He stressed the differences in water sources, varying as they did in temperature as well as in mineral, chemical, and bacterial content. Obviously, it would be most practical to test, indeed, to breed the bacteria in water where they might someday actually be used. He did not mention Villa Petrograd, but merely described as precisely as he dared what he required in the way of a test site. It was for the, KG, it was the, it was for the KGB's decision makers to scratch their heads, discuss the proposal in council, and come up with the proper location. Dr. Schutz's proposal, Group 17's proposal, made through Marshall Vasilovsky was rejected at first on the grounds that it involved the danger of precipitating by accident a bacteriological incident, a premature epidemic which would put the enemy on guard. This was, an ex this was as expected, since Dr. Schutz, in, the first in his first memorandum, did not suggest construction of a model water purification system to simulate the enemies. This was the essence of his plan. It went into the second memorandum thereby refuting the only argument the decision-makers had raised against his first proposal. They did not, again as expected, perceive the extremely dubious value of the idea as a whole. In the end, they approved the proposal and chose the Villa Petrograd as a test site. He had not underestimated their wisdom. He considered the possibility that they might accept the proposal, but send a Russian biologist instead of himself. He thought they would not. The record of Russian biologists sent to work in Western countries was deplorable. They defected with monotonous regularity. Dr. Schutz, they knew, could not defect. In that, they were correct. They did not know about Dr. Van Bruckner. The creation of Dr. Van Bruckner, the papers, the birth certificate, the quiet but distinguished and rather shadowy early years of his career, all of these would leave in his old friend, he would leave to his old friend, Frederick Castle, whose rise to political power he had first heard about in Novokunyansk through Gorupdishnets, the party grapevine whose efficiency seemed to increase rather than decline over the years since the end of the Third Reich. It was as if a sense of togetherness grew as survival was extended. When German newspapers were finally permitted him, he saw Frederick Castle's name, he saw Friedrich Castle's name more and more frequently and prominently in their columns until only a year ago he reached the lofty position of Minister of Defense. At first, Dr. Schutz wondered why a certain Friedrich Castle's activities in the old days, particularly the business of purging the Reich of undesirable citizens, unnamed, unmentioned, in the give and take of political campaigning, 
Dr. Schutz knew of at least three or four people still in Germany, alive and free to speak publicly, who knew the facts and could corroborate them. Then he began to see their names, too, rising in prominence, and he understood certain things were best left unmentioned. This situation, plus the possession of his weapon, assured the safety and prosperity of Dr. Hans von Brucker when he reached Germany. Beste Chung und Espering, und Espersung, or as the English called it, the carrot and the stick. Dr. Schutz rose from his chair and walked through the door into his bedroom. He looked out the window into the darkness, a cloudy night, no moon, no stars. He closed the Venetian blind carefully, turned on the lamp by his bed and closed the door. It had no lock, but in the months since he had arrived at the villa, no one had yet disturbed his evening privacy. That was one of the benefits that accompanied the loneliness of being in exile, a captive enemy and a spy. He opened a bureau drawer and took from it a square simulated leather box containing a collection of personal articles, a nail file, or nail file, scissors, a bottle of aspirin tablets, a shoehorn. It also contained an envelope of brown paper unsealed. He removed the envelope and emptied its contents onto the bed. American money, mostly silver, but including two $1 bills, all collected since he had reached the villa. It represented an indignity, the drab underside of espionage, not at all as its working frontiers, a glamorous profession, but one of scrabbling, improvisation, and mean living. One aspect in his case was that although the Russians provided him with comfortable quarters, he received no money at all. He counted what lay on his bed. It had been scrounged and filched. An occasional visitor left a tip in the dining room. Some left small change in their coat pockets on the villa's, in the villa's cloakroom. The dollar bills, a stroke of luck, he had found in a chair in the lounge. In all, six dollars and twenty cents. He was not familiar with American money, but he thought that surely this would be enough for two people on the first leg of his journey. TM9 had told him how this was done. A two-mile walk up the road that ran beside the villa's rear wall. At the end, he would find a highway where buses, silver and blue in color, ran to the city of Washington at regular intervals, most frequently in the morning, which was when he would go, making the walk up the road just before daylight. He made up his mind he would take the girl, if the money proved insufficient for the bus fare, he would simply leave her at the roadside. He would tell her to wave goodbye and walk away. That left two imponderables, both, he thought, minor. One was Georg Volter. There was no question of taking Georg with him. It was unlikely that the organization in Washington, which was part of a much more widespread organization, would be interested in helping Georg, who was not, one might say, a member of the club. But in any case, he was sure Georg, if asked, would refuse to go back to Germany. He was also sure that Georg would not talk, that is, say anything about the girl, since to do so would implicate himself. Georg, in short, was not important. They would simply ship him back to Novokunyansk. The other unknown was the Russians, including Kublitz. Their reaction was harder to predict. One thing was obvious. There could be no immediate hue and cry, since he was not officially present in America. He could not officially disappear nor be officially sought. His identity was unknown even to the embassy staff. He was simply a zookeeper, presumably a veterinarian. That was one reason, of course, that his departure was feasible. One does not put guards around a zoo. The KGB had counted on the fact that his life was forfeit if he should be caught by the Americans. He expected them to do one of two things, both by necessity, requiring time to set in motion. One, they, the KGB, could let it be known through channels not remotely connected with themselves or even with the Kremlin that he, Dr. Schutz, believed to be dead these many years, was in fact alive and at large in America. They could leak out a description and credible proof, even photographs. This would set in motion the American intelligence and police, and also probably that of the British, French, and Germans, certainly the Israelis. But by the time this happened, he should be safely in hiding, his new identity already close to certain. The other possibility was that the KGB would hunt him down themselves. This was a calculated risk. He could not avoid it. But again, it would take him, it would take time to get the search going. And once Dr. von Brucker came into existence, he did not mind if they searched for Helmuth Schultz. For Helmuth Schutz. In fact, it was likely that after an appropriate interval, Helmuth Schutz, or a reasonable facsimile, might be found somewhere in Europe already dead. 
He would take the girl as far as he conveniently could. Since Dr. Schutz was known to be traveling alone, she would be a useful part of his disguise. She would go along as his daughter, thereby reducing the chance of his detection. It remained only to decide on timing. And that is the end of chapter 16.